So welcome to the uh, Open Active W3C community group call today. I'm going to talk about data quality. So I'll do a very quick introduction um, to the to the topic. And then we'll hear from Ollie at London Sport with an example of how variability in the data affects user experiences. And we'll talk about um, data quality action planning with Rebecca Strickland from the Office of Natural Statistics Data Quality Hub. And then we'll have some time at the end to talk about some of the broader issues. So I'll just, um, we're, I'm going to have a quick poll, if that's okay, if people are familiar with Slido. And this is just to get a feel for who we've got on the call and what kind of roles they're in. So it's pretty even split between data publishers and both data publishers and users. Not much in the just straight data users. Okay. Um, and so I wanted to talk about um, data quality and, and some of the challenges that we're seeing at the minute. In the early days of Open Active, the idea is to get people to publish the data, get some data out there, and we try to make it as easy as possible to publish data. So we focused on that, uh, optimize the standards to make it easy for people to get data out there. So if you picture a slide and scale between the optimized for data publishers and optimized for data users, we're over at this end. Uh, the, the challenge is now as we move um, forward and the number of data users is growing, we're starting to find new uses for the data, broader use cases like social prescribing, that's one we're exploring at the minute. And we're finding that that variability in the data uh, is making it difficult for users to pick up the data, to do things with it, to publish it, to work with it, to visualize it, to interact with it. And many are having to rely on intermediaries. So we've got that one slider from the standards are optimized for data publishers to data users. And where are we? We're over this side. And there's this idea of another slider that says, how much intermediation should we should we have? How much um, work should should there be something in the middle that takes that data from the publishers, which got all this variability and makes it really simple for data users to consume? So how much of a role is there for an intermediary, and is that the role of the the um, Open Active Initiative to kind of manage that? those um that intermediate role so i just wanted to explore some of those ideas but the slide of things not not playing well i've lost my link so because uh, i'll come back to that in a minute so how does it relate to data quality obviously what's perceived as um data quality issues from a data user perspective are those things that affect the user experiences um something may meet the specification of the standard but because of the variability in the way the data is entered or the data, way data is captured, or indeed some flexibility in the standard, that has those knock-on data quality effects that affect that user experience at the far end. So I want to try and look at this broader view of data quality across the, uh, the, the initiative. So I think with that, yeah, those, so those are some questions there about intermediation. And is that an appropriate use of the money for Sport England to, to play that role in the middle? Is that a sustainable role? You know, how does it, um, how would that work in the long term? Should the market provide that that uh, intermediate position as it, as it has done so far? So I wanted to explore people's perceptions of where we were on that slider and where we should be. So uh, maybe it's a bit, if this uh, poll works, we'll get back to that later. Uh, but for now, I'll hand over to Ollie to show us um, an example of what I'm talking about. Bring it to life for us, Ollie. Cool. Thanks, Howard. Just try and share my screen. It says I cannot share my screen. Can you stop sharing your screen, please? I can't. I have stopped. Yeah. <clears throat> cool. Hopefully, you can all see that that now. Yeah, perfect. Yep. Okay, cool. Um, so I'm going to run through a few pages on GACTIV, which is London Sports Activity Finder, um, and show a few different examples. So when we talk about data quality today, I'm not talking about things like images, descriptions, titles. I'm looking more at the way that the feeds are, are set up um, and then how that works from a user's perspective. 
Um, and so just to give you an example to begin with, before we move on to specifics, this is just a genic, generic search done on GetActive. And you can kind of see here that straight away from user's perspective, it's probably not the best experience. You've got um, a list of the same session happening over and over and over as I keep scrolling. So that's kind of where we're starting from, as just to showcase that there are a few things we need to kind of fix to make these experience best as possible. Um, and <clears throat> what we found is I think there's three levels the way that the sessions are displayed. Um, and if I run through them now and showcase them to you, um, and I'm going to use some feeds to showcase. So I'm not picking on specific feeds, it just happens to be um, the ones that I found that fit the mold. Um, so to begin with, this is the, the R Parks feed. Um, and you can see here that, for example, um, we have a boot camp session on Saturday 15th at 9.30, and the same session taking place the week after, but both sessions are displaying. This is because each session in the R Parks feed, and I think I was the same, is an individual event rather than being grouped together. So every single event will be displayed on Get Active. Um, which arguably maybe isn't the worst, but when we get to lots and lots and lots of the same session, it starts to clock up the feed. Um, so that's the like the first level, I think, of where some feeds are at. Um, the second level, I'm using open sessions example here, is where I've got two sessions here. They're exactly the same session. They're both they're both test sessions I've added, both copy football, both taking place in the same location on the same date, um, you can see that different time slots. So if I click into this copy here, you can see I've got multiple sessions taking place on different dates, all at 12 o'clock. And if I go back, it's exactly the same here. I've got multiple different dates, but the same time, three o'clock. But because these are the same sessions, but because they've got different time slots, um, they're currently coming through as two different displaying two separate sessions on Get Active. And I think this is how a lot of the feeds are currently set up is that sessions of different time slots are creating individual occurrences on the end user's platform. Um, and again, from an end user's experience, what we want to see is one session displaying all of the occurrences within that session. Um, and that moves us on to like the final level, um, which is where I'm using Playway as an example here. Um, I pick this session and you can see if I click on the, the top down here, they've got different dates and different times. So seven o'clock or 7 a.m., 10 a.m. So every single occurrence of this session is displayed within one individual session on, on Get Active. And therefore, from user experience, they would see that one session and it looks nicer. And when we're comparing, I guess, to, to other sectors, so I the example I kind of put in my head was the was a cinema, you'd only expect to see a movie once with one with a time slot underneath it rather than seeing the same movie listed time after time after time um it just makes it a nicer end user experience so they're the three levels that we've come across that we think different feeds are at um and so open sessions included we have some work to do um to improve that open session specifically we're currently only using the session series feed not a scheduled session feed so our recommendation would be and this is what we're doing is that all feeds use a session series with scheduled sessions. Um, and as part of that, on then the on this on the system side for the, the actual user inputting, again on open sessions currently, we don't allow people to add multiple different time slots for the same session, which obviously again is causing that issue. Um, so we would recommend that on the system side where the users are inputting the data. It's set up so that you can add multiple occurrences under a different session. So you can have, like players have here, different time slots and different times and different dates all in one session. I know that, I know, for example, uh, Tom and Played Reach have kind of set up like that. And that's what we're trying to do at the moment. Um, but this is what we've seen. Um, and yeah, ideally, we want to get away from this user experience where you have the same session posted however many times in a row to this where one session has all of the occurrences listed underneath it. Um, so that's, I guess, a quick summary of where we see the feeds and the systems, and maybe there's some work to do there in terms of potentially 
what's required in the standards in terms of sessions to the schedule session and then the systems themselves maybe there's a bit of work for the end user to be able to input the data correctly um and just to maybe touch on one more thing whilst i'm whilst i'm here um another thing we think is really important is that when a user on the end platform such as get active gets to a session and wants to find out more or book that slot they are taken to the to the right place um so i'm going to use here a, a gll example where we've got loads of sessions here and if i click on this session and click reserve spot you can see it takes me directly to that session so really easy for user to book onto that session i'm just going to use here this is everyone active again just using that example if I click on this session and click reserve spot, it takes me to the um, leisure center page, which I guess is really helpful, but the next step would be going onto the actual booking page, specific like GL I've done here. Um, so again, we think from user experience side, the easier we can make it for that user, um, the better experience. And again, maybe there's something to look at the standards here on what, what is required for that booking URL link. Um, so that's a yeah, really quick run through, um, Howard, and hopefully it all makes sense. And hopefully, yeah, maybe we can have some discussions around yeah. what we've going forward. So we've got um, sorry, go on. Oh, before I jump in. I was gonna say on the G is it the GLL model that you've presented? Um, that's them changing their their booking engine so that um the booking interface is exposed to people that are not logged in. Um which is a, a fundamental change to the booking engine itself. Whereas if you use the, the Gladstone current one for plus two, and Andrew's there with me, connect, um, then you have to log in to see those sessions. So it's not a simple change. It's a it's quite a fundamental change to the products that the that the operator is using to make bookings online. Um, possibly the new um, Gladstone product will allow people to view bookings without logging in, maybe, but not every operator's moved to that. I know we certainly haven't, and there'll be a lot of others that haven't. Um, but yeah, I'm just pointing out that it's not just something that the operator is in control of changing. It's a, it's a software change, fundamental application change. I think so. And um, you know, before we get in trying to solve those two examples or so that uh, that Ollie's shared, it's it's about just trying to understand um, you know, the differences, the flexibility in the standard or the, the way it's interpreted by different organizations, how that you know, has an end result, a knock-on effect, a negative impact, effect, impact on the user experience at the end of the day for people who are trying to find a, an activity. And that's what it's all about at the end of the day, to try and people make it as easy as possible for people to get booked and go and do something healthy. So um, we got, we had two examples there. The first one is, and and I'll hand over to people who've been on Open Active for longer than me, uh, just to clarify. But there are different ways to to categorize series or repeated events, and we're seeing that different operators use different methods, and that creates this variability. And, and that results in, a, in a, an eroded user experience. And then that was the first example. And then the second one was around, there's a slot in the data where you put the booking URL and we're seeing different behaviors, even whether or not, you know, that might be, everyone might use the exact session in that URL but you're getting a different behavior depending on whether or not you're already logged in. Is that right to, you know, technical people? Is that what we're seeing? Nick, I'm going to pick on you because it's... Uh, sorry, I was just struggling to find the unmute button, but that's a totally fair thing to do. Uh, yeah, I think that... I think... I think uh, yeah, sorry, I'll be, I'll be here as well. Uh, I think, um, yeah, the what that's a good characterization. I was going to talk to the, the next bit, but yes. Okay. Um, so I think what you know what we want to, to capture is that's an example of data quality 
in the initiative and and that's what we want to move on we want to kind of look at a, a broader way or a more strategic way of exploring this these issues and capturing them prioritizing them working out you know what's the right approach um and and so that i think that's a really good and helpful example ollie and i won't dwell on the detail now but i'd like to move on to hand over to Rebecca from ONS's Data Quality Hub to talk about um, some of their experiences and their approaches to tackling such such challenges. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Excellent. Um, so uh, to introduce myself, I'm Rebecca Strickland. I work in the Government Data Quality Hub, which is based in the Office for National Statistics. And my job is helping people in the public sector better understand the quality of their data and improve it. And I'm really interested in the data that you guys have got and how we can give you some pointers towards making improvements. Um, so um, I'm going to slightly repurpose some slides that I've used elsewhere. Uh, so hopefully you can forgive the fact that they're a little bit more government focused, um, perhaps, than where you're coming from. Um, but really at the root of the approach that we um, promote is to think about quality in terms of fitness for purpose and how well the data that you have and that you share supports the different ways in which it's used. And it's really important to remember that point that we're all using data in different ways, because this isn't about pointing at data and saying, oh, this is terrible. Um, and it's not about kind of blaming errors or anything like that. It's more about understanding the strengths and limitations of data. Um, and being able to have an educated conversation that says, OK, this data is well suited to this purpose, but it is much less suited to this purpose, which can sometimes mean we might need to make some improvements to get to um, make that fit for purpose. Or it might be that we just put some caveats around it. And I think that those examples um, that Ollie showed us were quite interesting because I'm willing to bet that that exact same record works perfectly well perhaps for the supplier and that actually it, the data can be very fit for their internal use and it can look great for them and and that's fine it's when you put that data in a different context that it starts to um, not meet the expectations we might have of quality um, so really what I'm going to talk about today, um, you see it on the slide, it was um, data quality action plans on the agenda. This is one of the toolkits that we um, we work through with people in government to help them better understand their data. And it can be something perhaps that could be used with open active data to understand the strengths and limitations of the data um, and how we can best target some of the data that might not be meeting expectations um, to improve it and the ways in which we'd go about doing that. So I'm going to do um, a kind of a whistle stop tour um, of what data quality action plans are. You may relate to it, you may not. Um, they're a tool that works well for people who are actively managing a data set and looking after a data set. Um, it's less relevant to people who might be more in the user role, but hopefully you'll still see some value in it. So I'm going to try and share my slides. Um, so for those of you who are close to data, and it's a bit difficult because I don't really know a lot of your backgrounds and your technical um, abilities and comfortableness with, with data. So I'm going to do my best, um, but feel free to ask any questions afterwards um, and stop me if I'm, if I'm not making any sense at all. But with a lot of data quality work, it's quite traditional to, to look at the data and, and think, right, what questions can I ask about this data that helps me understand if it's good enough? The limitations there is we can spend a lot of time obsessing about things that don't have an impact. And also we can't tell that story that I was just saying, that nuanced story that is the data might be working perfectly well for one person and completely failing another because we're not saying their data is good or bad, we need to be able to say whether it's fit for these different purposes. Um, one of the problems we've struggled with in government as well is that sometimes when we find a quality problem, it can be difficult to um, be able to understand how best to tackle it um, without wasting our time and money just going through and fixing typos. Um, and there's a perception quite often that what we're talking about is spending time and money fixing typos. And, and that's not really the ask. It's about making the sustainable changes that makes data better for everybody. Um, and also that this is something that 
comes over as an admin issue. So if you're sitting here thinking, oh, data quality, that sounds like an admin issue, I'm here to change your mind. Um, so why do we recommend data quality action plans? Why we sort of have this particular approach is that it's it gives you some repeatable measurements that tell you about the health of your data set over time. It will give you a picture of how things change, how it improves, hopefully, or if something else happens along the way that starts to bring the quality of the data down, it'll give you those pictures as well. It's linked to the purpose of the data, which means we can have that conversation about how data varies for different uses. And it also helps you to tackle the reason um, the data went wrong in the first place, rather than just fixing a load of typos or doing a lot of admin work on your data. So that's the overall goal for data quality action plan. Um, which is all well and good, but what is it? So I said that um, the traditional way is to start picking through your data, looking for errors. We're going to not do that. We're going to flip this on its head and we're going to say, what is the data for? And you'll see, because it's government, this was originally delivered for, um, I think, the Ministry of Justice. And so that's why we've got that little picture of, um, uh, um, of a slightly more government related thing. But um, really what we're saying with our data is that this data doesn't exist for fun, it exists for providers to be able to provide classes to um, people for, for um, people to be able to book onto um, active opportunities. It also can push into those kind of further away things. So we were talking about social prescribing. Um, so this data can go to meet a lot of different needs. Um, it can help um, providers to um, improve retention or something like that. All of this is feeding into these many different uses of the data. So we start off by thinking about what is this data for? If you have a gym, how are you using it? Um, not from a kind Kind of like a report based level but like what is it doing for you to have this data um you don't hold this for fun this enables you to deliver services and really it's really important to make sure that that data is good for your service so in order to achieve this outcome what parts of the data need to be right is it about the dates of the activity is it about uh the people data so about um you know how many spaces you've got or about who's taking that class is it about the location which parts need to be right in order to meet this activity now for some you can see that if you were talking about we want an overall national picture of what opportunities are available, things like the individual location becomes much less important. We don't need to worry about the quality of the um, location. We don't need to necessarily worry about the quality about who's running the session. We're much more about like what are the numbers of sessions, um, what sorts of things are on offer. If you were starting to talk about like this data exists to help a person book a session, then all of a sudden I care an awful lot about how far I have to travel to that gym to access that class. And those needs become much more important. And actually the overall picture of whether or not I could take an archery class in Scotland doesn't matter to me if I live in Somerset. So it's much more about those kind of other parts of the data set. So we're looking at different parts of the data set for different purposes. So in order to achieve these outcomes, these parts of the data need to be right. And then what does right look like? So we saw some really good examples there in um, Ollie's demo, but we recommend thinking about these things about your data. And this isn't a che te checklist. We're not saying like all data must be all of these things, but there's some quite useful ways to think about your data. Um, so we're saying that good data should be complete. It means that it should be a complete record of all the opportunities that you have on offer. Um, and it should be um, a that all the critical fields should be in there. So for example, there's no point in having your activity up um, and then not having a date, let's say, if it's if that's a critical field. Um, so good data should be complete. Good data should be unique. As we've seen there, you would expect each location to only be present once if we're talking about a provider. I don't know enough about your data to know if that is part of the data set, but each activity should only be present once. You shouldn't have multiple ones in the same place. Um, the data should be timely. So there's no point in um, having some data coming through about a activity that happened three months ago um, at my local gym. I know that they have their kind of like their Christmas Santa run thing up for three months after, um, after it's actually taken place, but there's no point in providing that, that data isn't timely anymore. Um, good data should be valid, which means it should match the 
types, pattern and structure that we expect. So this is more about kind of the business rules and it fits a little bit more with that compliance with the standard. So it's about looking at whether or not it looks like what we expect it to look like. It could be as simple as um, I'm sort of expecting that there won't be any activities in the year 2222, uh, for example. So it can be those kind of like typo level things um, and that perhaps a activity shouldn't be 100 hours long. Um, things like that can come into those checks. Um, good data should be accurate, which means it should match reality. It's a really hard one, but a really important one. Um, but it's something to consider that whether or not your data matches reality. And then it should be consistent. So it should match other sources of data that are around the same um, subject, or it could be internally consistent where um, if you've got two parts of the data set that should agree, um, that they agree. So now we've got a kind of picture that we're building up that says in order to deliver um, this outcome, these parts of the data set need to be right. And right would look like some of these things, not all of them, not a tick list. You could be saying, right, in order to provide a picture of um, offer nationally, then the um, activity information needs to be right, which means it should be complete um, and it should be valid because we're going to be doing some aggregation on that. But actually, we're not too worried if that's consistent with something else. We're just going to take those two things and, and, and do some work on that. Um, and then we get to the point of where we actually do the measurements. So I said we're flipping it on its head. Normally, people start here with what can I measure? This helps to structure um, and get us to a place where we are measuring the things that matter. That means we're measuring the things that will have an impact on the way that you use the data, as well as the way that other people use the data, and that we can tell that very different story about how your use of the data might vary from somebody else's, um, and that we can talk about how the data providers use might differ from the kind of the aggregated data use. Um, it also means we're not spending time measuring things that don't have an impact, um, which is quite an important thing for government because we can quite often just go for what's easy to measure rather than what matters. That's why we recommend this tool so often. Uh, so here's a little picture from a flooding example. Um, I don't unfortunately have a um, nice activity one, uh, but it's about saying if our data helps us model future flood risk, you might be saying that our data helps us understand future um, fitness needs or something, what needs to be right. And then you build a plan out for this so that you end up with a whole load of measurements. I'm going to skip over that because it's a little bit environment agency focused. Uh, and that means that you can then say when you look at the data and you see what passes and fail, you can start to see how much of the those different outcomes are at risk which means as a kind of a picture you can then have that conversation so that we're not saying this data is good or bad we're saying it works for you we're not telling you that it's broken we're telling you if it works for you great but actually we have these other needs and if we're going to deliver these needs um, then we're going to need some improvements the advantage of that is especially in a data area like this where those data needs are different, but are really closely aligned. We can see how improving the data for some of perhaps the the um, more um, the less visible uses, so things like better pr social prescribing, can actually have a reinforcing view back onto um, data providers, because that will drive demand back to data providers. And so, although these needs are different they aren't really in competition and improving the data for one will improve the delivery for another um, so that's something that we do with a lot of people data quality action plans and it's something that i've proposed that we could talk about um, with this data set um, but really if i've got one ask it's to to think about quality in terms of those different needs um, and think about what your own quality expectations are on that data and how well that data works for you but also how those further benefits um, that might come from other people's use of the data will also have that knock-on benefit for you. So that's my super quick whistle-stop tour of data quality action plans. There's a lot more about this I can um, share if anybody is really keen to know more. Um, but other than that, I'm going to stop talking and say any questions if we've got time for that. I made the cardinal mistake of not actually asking how long I had, I've just talked. That's fine, and it was spot on, I think. So, um, thank you, thank you, Rebecca. Um, I, I, I meant to say at the start that I would explain how this thinking on data quality 
impacts on what we're planning for this phase of open active. So I'll say that now. Basically, we we want to explore data quality, and we'll we're likely to work through an exercise as a community that that uh, Rebecca's just described. So some kind of action planning, looking at which aspects of the data are really important for the different use cases. And we have the discovery use case, people finding something to do. We have the booking use case, being able to book onto that course. And then we have some emerging use cases like social prescribing. So we want to explore um, data quality in those contexts and explore any impacts on the specifications and the standards that we've got. Um, so explore if we need to be tighter in our um, in the standards and, and more restrictive to make it easier for people to use data. Uh, you know, these are the things to explore. And then we'll do some work to upgrade the tooling and the resources and guidance to reflect any updates to the standards. So there's that kind of logical flow. Explore the data, data quality analysis, data quality framework, um, reviewing the standards, making updates if necessary, and then reviewing the tooling to reflect those. So, but I'm gonna pause now and um, open it up. You know, let's have some discussion if um, if people are happy to to um, to share any thoughts. I, if not, I've got I found a slide though, so I can ask some more questions. But do people want to jump in uh, for, for ten minutes or so? Um, any responses to 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 what we've seen? Any yeah hi everyone um tom here from played um i thought both of those were were super interesting and yeah i think it's useful to think about the different contexts of which the data is designed like set for and um we build activity finders so we kind of see it from the same context and uh, have similar problems to what ollie was displaying and um i feel like It'll be a, a useful conversation to have around um, like what the quality bar is. I know that it's not always going to be perfect and the solution of getting systems to change their architecture to fit different end use cases is going to be a challenge, but I feel like there needs, we could start a conversation around what like um, is a quality bar that would enable the use cases that are around to work well enough to to deliver a, an experience but like what we're used to seeing is um like low like say if we look at it from a num numerical perspective so it's not um opinion on on whether data meets the quality standard or not i feel like all open data, well, especially um, if we're talking about sessions here, there's a certain amount of data points um, within that session that we need to understand whether it's usable based on like, I know, does it have an image? Does it have a price? Does it have all these different key elements and what priority looks like? Um, <clears throat> and try and understand quicker what when it doesn't meet that criteria and have a quicker feedback loop to the feeds that aren't meeting that, whatever that lower standard is, um, if that makes sense. So that I think the challenge we see on a day-to-day -day basis is, is kind of us noticing it within our experience, having to kind of dig behind the scenes to understand who the provider is, go a bit back and forth to find where we can improve that data and it just seems to get washed away. There doesn't seem like there's a, a feedback loop that will continually improve the quality of data over time. Um, and if we could kind of have objective measures as to what is decent, good enough quality data to be used by people like data, data consumers, then I think that would be a good start. So um, just to, to cut in then, so I think we're, we're seeing identifying uh, the very much what you just spoke about, I think, um, was around what I would call completeness, you know, the completeness of the imagery, the, the description field, the titles, the pricing, et cetera. So those are those are things that we can measure and we can, you know, automate those kind of measurements. So we've got to, we can create some, some draft measures um, or draft reporting on those measures and, uh, you know, share that for discussion, see if uh, we don't want, 
be, you know, we've got to be careful of setting targets and driving perverse behavior, just bung anything in so you hit your completeness score, you know, that that can happen. Um, so that would be my thought, that, you know, that we need to explore those from that data um, user, consumer perspective. Has anyone else got any, any kind of first reactions or thoughts? I think, David here, from everyone active, I think you've got to be careful on some of this, though, because like you're saying there about images, we don't necessarily have images. We don't necessarily need images. So, and, and for us to put images in all our data is an enormous amount of work to do that. So you're never going to get 100% every supplier, every, every data publisher doing it in exactly the same way. And, and, and doing it at the same level of completeness. The fact that we don't have all those images in our data, for example, doesn't mean it's, it's a, I mean, it's certainly not a problem for us because we don't need it. So we'd be doing something for the benefit of everybody else as opposed to it being of real benefit for us as a company. And I appreciate that there could be benefits for us by doing that because it's better on these other websites, you know, on, on, on the data users, you know, so yeah. I, I, I appreciate that. But I think you've just got to consider that um, just because a particular data user wants it in this way, that that then should become part of the standard or, you know, because we're not just going to spend weeks and weeks putting in a lot of images that match everyone because it's just, it's not, it's, we're yeah. not going to do it. Um, and and just to go back to um, <clears throat> something that Ollie was making in terms of he's seeing all these items and they're all duplicated, etc. To me, that feels more like um, an end, you know, a presentation thing that, you know, we're presenting the data, so we do store that data in that way, so and 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 we publish it out in that way. So isn't it? there is some responsibility on the data user to be able to sort that data and present it in the way that they want it to be displayed, as opposed to necessarily the data publisher's responsibility to be able to send it in exactly the way that that data publisher wants to make use of it. Because data publishers, they weren't going to want to make use of it in different ways. And it's it's going to be impossible to be able to do it, meet every data user's requirements. I do believe that there's possibly um, some cataloging and categorization that we need to do with data, which would probably make it a lot easier, um, which brings me on to my pet subject for us as an industry, which I think that we really do need to sort out, and that is about definitions of data, and we need to really agree what we mean by particular pieces of data, and we need to agree that across, across the industry and we need to have some standard definitions. And it feels to me like that's one of the basics that we need to concentrate on. And once we've got some agreed standards of definitions, that then allows us to move on to get a much better quality set of data, which makes it uniform across the industry and everybody can have the same meaning behind it. I mean, our marketing team have got a wonderful at coming up with all sorts of names for things like yoga, for example, but ultimately at the end of the day, it's yoga and people want to know that it's yoga. So, I mean, it's, 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 it's how, we, how, we, how we come up with standards which allow us all to, you know, link the two together so that yoga means yoga wherever we go sort of thing. That's my pet subject, I think. And, and that's my biggest issue in terms of data quality. I will, I will. Yeah. So, <clears throat> sorry, um, just to jump in there, I think that's, um, yeah, there's always different like ends of the industry that like these standards might not kind of particularly work for. The images thing, I think, was just an example that I used. Um, and yeah, completely understand that that's where a lot of systems different, a, a lot of providers differ. But I do think we need to like try and look at data quality from an end user perspective, if it's going to be, because otherwise I feel like if we're trying to please too many things through this lens, like we need to consider like the whole point of open active is to make it easier for people to access sport and physical activity. And like, ideally that is framed from someone looking to take part in an activity. Um, I think if we look at the use cases out there, that is the 
but a majority of the, the biggest use case by far uh, and all the other use cases at the moment are speculation. Um, so it is important that like the data meets the quality of the use cases that exist, not the other way around and thinking. That, so I'd, I'm just saying it's a good starting point. Otherwise we won't make progress is like the data quality should have certain standards with a, with a, uh, a framing on the end user experience or else it's for, for me not useful brilliant i believe i've got the um the slide up and running again so if people the link is probably still in the chat is it yes yeah, so if you want to click on that um and i just wanted to to get people's perspectives on um we talked about this tom just said there you know focusing on those data consumers uh, and the big use case right now is the discovery. So I wondered if I just wanted to kind of capture where where people think we are and where people think we we kind of should be. Uh, we're talking about how the standards are structured and specified. And so on a scale of one to ten, where do you think they're optimized for publishers? We know it's I feel it's in that direction, but just to get people's feelings for where where they should be. Can you see that now? Yeah, those, that's those great. Goals? Yeah. Um, I'm going to try and move on to the next question. And this, where do we think the standard should be optimized? Click on that polls link again. It's probably the best, the easiest way to see it. Sorry if this is a bit slapdash, but I'm just trying to get a a feel for. I've got the answers, but not the questions in. Can people just see the results? Excellent. And I'm going to move on to one last. There is a question there. So do you have any examples of data quality issues or concerns that affect your work and your user experience, your users' experiences? And um, a few people have mentioned mentioned them there. It's possible just to capture them uh, and we'll add these to the to the to the slide deck. Um, Nick for posterity, don't worry. There's some more coming through now. So I think, is anyone, we've got a few minutes left. Does anyone want to um, add any thoughts or are people just type in a way? I mean, I can say that um, I think it's a great idea to come have a bit of a plan uh as, as Beck kind of proposed just just in terms of the, the overall where are the challenges and then maybe helping providers to understand if they are I mean obviously uh, David kind of alluded that he he's aware that the images aren't that great but then also you know he's got to make a business case internally for improving them um but but I, I suppose aside from obvious things like that that maybe people are already aware of for their own feeds um getting to the, the bottom of things which maybe are not people are not so aware of where their own feeds might not be quite meeting the specs or um as as kind of ollie presented um that's a ollie's presentation was instances where the specs were were, were kind of there but not but not quite being used in the right way and that not quite then has that knock-on effect of how it looks um the newer the implementation of open active generally speaking the, the the better more conformant they are um because i think over time people have been investing more in making the the, the feeds more compliant rather than kind of getting the, the quickest thing done um and so um that's been a good learning i think as time's gone on which then really explains why the gll one for example is you can see quite comprehensive because it's one of the newer feeds some considerable considerable time went in from their side to make sure that met all the specs 
um, obviously the Everan Active one's a little bit older, but um, that they've got most of the same stuff in there. Um, so uh, yeah, but but not as old as some of the feeds that we've got, um, because both of those two examples are, are still relatively recent compared to a lot of the feeds that we've got in Open Active. Um, so there's 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 a data quality for the engaged audience, which is this group of people, and a lot of those feeds are newer. And then there's a broader data quality across all the Open Active data, which you'll find some people that aren't coming to these calls necessarily because they're less engaged at the moment. And there might be some work to move that forward. And I think another interesting reflection on the, the chart that we've seen, as I think if you if you do the standards properly, I think you'd feel that they were quite focused on the data user, not the data publisher. Um, but some of the much older feeds, which were done quite quickly, are done in a way that really made sh shortcuts that made them more data publisher kind of focused. So again, the more engaged audience here would probably feel that they're, you know, everything is very focused on data users because I'd say the standards are and the implementations if done well are. Um, and that's what we've seen here. Whereas some of the older feeds again, which are not represented in this room, might be considered to be more towards data publisher because they were done more quickly um, and and shortcuts taken. And those shortcuts obviously were for the data publisher's benefit to make it a cheaper implementation, but have a knock on effect of the data user side. I don't know if that narrative kind of helps explain why I, potentially we might be seeing what we're seeing here and how the different people's perceptions of things uh, uh, differ depending on who you ask and things like that. Yeah, I mean, undoubtedly, you know, per perceptions are going to are going to vary, um, and it's it, the point of this is to kind of build a better picture of of those perceptions across the community, understand what's important, understand the kind of enthusiasm of, of where that that people have for for moving us towards a better place, um, and obviously, it's not just enthusiasm; it, it's understanding the challenge of adapting any work that's already been doing um you know can can those people who implemented early start to adopt some of the newer changes and will that you know is that going to solve the problems is that going to meet um improve the the end experience for for the data consumers those are the things we're going to explore um i think and one of the things that was mentioned was was definitions and the yoga was an example. I think I'm interested to see if we can use more of the um, the activity list, you know, that people are, are hooked into already. That's part of the spec to, you know, describe an activity. You can select it from the activity list. Um, I mean, it could be, could it be as simple as attaching a default picture for that activity to the activity list? And that if, um, if a you know bespoke image isn't provided for an activity, you can always pull that one from there in the end um, to to fill those gaps for end users. You know, is that a solution? Is that an option? To yeah, just on that, Howard. That like, we do that. I've, that's why I put in here one of the um, issues is around. I'd say the activity type creates that exact problem like where we we augment pictures so pictures aren't as much of an important piece of data although they are valuable as say activity type price time there's like that's what i want to if we can make some progress as to like what's the mvp level of data points that is deemed as high enough data quality to feed into the system i i, I completely agree on photos photos you can kind of augment I think we lost Tom. So thank you very much, everyone. Um, really useful. And apologies for the glitches with Slido, but we got there in the end, I think, and we've got some useful some useful thoughts down there. Thank you very much to Ollie for bringing um, an example, bringing the issue to life. And thank you very much to Rebecca and Bix from, from ONS um, for giving us a lot to think about there and a, and a way forward. So just, just to wrap up, I think, we want to explore those ideas of what data do we need and uh, an MVP as Tom described it there for, um, for 
the biggest, the main use cases that we're exploring. And, and, and that's what we'll do. We'll look at how we can report on those and try and find a way forward to improve those data quality, to improve the experiences, to get people moving ultimately. So um, thank you all very much. If you've got any, any further thoughts, please use the, the Slack um, or yeah, uh, just, just uh, get in touch. So thank you all.